All right. Let's get back to our segmentation discussion uh, that we started last time, and we will continue today. And I hope to get to some practical exercises at the end. Uh, so, as introduced last time, essentially we have images, and especially if they're well resolved, we will typically see different groups of grayscales in the image. And they typically mean something, that that's something that we image. So here I have three types of relatively homogeneous materials. One is glass beads, one is water, one is air. I do see some noise in the image, but overall my eyes have no trouble recognizing where these fluids are in the pore space. And if I'm interested in just like how, what is the saturation, where the fluids are, how are they spatially arranged, I can even see clear interface. So I might be interested in interface curvature, relating it to the applied capillary pressure, all kinds of things, right? But to get there, I actually kind of have to get my hands on all of these pixels saying, well, this is water, this is air, this is glass, okay? And image as it stands now doesn't know that. It's your eyes that are doing the classification. Okay? So this process of sorting images or sorting all of the voxels in what I would say bins or phases that are clearly identified is called segmentation. How many do we need have in there? That depends on what I imaged. In this case, it's three. But I might be simply interested in coarse space versus solid space, or rather fluid phases versus solid phases, okay? In which case, I would have two. So it depends on your application. And I cannot stress enough that the segmentation is a crucial step in image analysis because everything that I want to do depends on segmentation for the most part. Or some way quantifying, and in, especially if I have resolved images for quali qu quantification, I need segmentation. If I have unresolved images and you played with those uh, <clears throat> medical CT in one of the exercises where there was like particulates inviting, uh, invading sphere pack, Okay? You couldn't see individual spheres, nor the particulates in there. So in that case, you're just dealing with grayscales and trying to quantify based on the grayscales okay, at certain saturation level. But other than that, in most cases where you have a resolved image, you do need to segment first before doing anything else. <laughs> and related problems, as outlined last time, are finding edges or object recognition. This is tailored to photographs and process processing massive amounts of photographs. We know that these days even phones recognize our faces, and that's obviously object recognition, and it is a type of segmentation. Now, if you have any image, you have two things you mostly rely on. One is the actual image value. So here's like a one slice through the beads. This is glass beads and pore space. Actually, there are two types of beads in there. They're slightly different grayscale value. But, so when I actually look, if I took all of these values, numerical values in the image, and showed them as a surface above a little plane, this is what I would get. This is some sort of like elevation map. Okay. And I would obviously see that in glass beads, I have higher levels. Those are grayscale values that are sort of close to 200 and above, okay, these. And then I have the lower ones, uh, which are uh, which are rated where my air is, and that's one way to kind of try to sort what these things are. I can also look at the edges, and there is a find edges routine that I pointed out uh, in one of the previous lectures that I actually compute uh, absolute value of the gradient and its central differencing scheme. In your introductory numerical class, you should. Uh, you should know about how to do it. So I can look at the image as simply a field, right? the two-dimensional field, and I can take partial derivatives all I want, and I can also find the absolute value of the gradient. So basically, high values of the gradient indicate these jumps here, and I can indicate those. So between those two values, that's typically what we're going to use to sort out where my phases are. Now, is it simple? Let's see. And again, if you want to do this, I did share the data 
on canvas. Um, if you want to do this just to uh, find out these two plots, you can do analyze 3D surface plot above an image for, for slices of images that works well. And you can do find edges as well. Now, is this easy? So basic idea is, okay, when I look at, we looked at histograms quite a bit, I do a cumulative analysis of all of the stuff that I, all of the image values that I see in my images. And then I will typically, especially in the case, previous case, I expect to see distinct populations of these <coughs> values. And in this case, there was the, this some three-phase image where there was oil, glass, and water. Okay? And then I have to decide, okay, ideally, those are, if they're separated well, I can simply just set a threshold and say everything above this threshold is water. Everything between this and this two thresholds is glass. And everything below is oil. If I do it this, this way, am I doing any mistakes? As in misclassifications. Am I going to have glass beads voxels that are identified as oil phase and oil phase voxels that are identified as glass? Even statistically, if you think about it, if these were truly two populations, then basically my this mode would be fit like you can think of a Gaussian that you fit under, and another that you there is an overlap of those two Gaussians. And in that overlap, all you're doing is taking scissors and cutting it apart. Okay? So there will be some misclassification. Now, if your number of pixels here is very low, which actually here it very it really is. The number of misclassified voxels doesn't matter statistically. You can find the number of this, this height of this normalized by all of the voxels in the image is very small. Okay? Because this is a histogram, so I, I have the frequency, I have the number of them showing up. Okay? So in that sense, relatively speaking, like even if I make a mistake, it's no one. Okay? Now, as this goes, now here are they doing more mistakes. And as this is kind of moving up and up and up, okay, I'm doing more and more mistakes to the point that we know that it's some when I don't have am, ample resolution and I have a lot of blurry, they might I might barely see two peaks. They're kind of overlapping a lot. I might need to do some filtering to get them to separate better. Okay, so in that sense, I'm going to do much more mistakes. Okay, so that's something that you all, always have to look into. And again, sometimes it's not so clear. Is this another phase? Just looking at the histogram, is this another phase or not? I don't know. I've got to look at the image, right? So you do look at the histogram and statistics, but do look at the image to try to identify what is going on. And if this is actually a separate phase, you care about to identify. Okay? So there is this, most of the methods out there or the simplest methods, thresholding is really cheap to do. It's easy. Am I above or below a value? Couldn't make it easier. Okay. And a lot of segmentation methods are glorified thresholding okay. in some way, or searching for a magic threshold. Okay. If you, there is no such thing as just immediately evaluating a histogram, a histogram and finding a magic threshold. Okay. There is actually a discrepancy between what you see in statistics and what you actually need to identify the image. So you have to kind of go back and forth and decide that it's good. Rare images are so clearly distinguished, such as these two here, that there is no doubt. Okay. No need to do anything more expensive here. Just chop it up. Good to go. Okay. Um, um, a little bit of cleanup and we're good. So in that sense, don't spend time with like a very expensive method if you have a really good image. But most of the time that's not the case because forest media uh, are complex. So this is my little sphere pack. So I can actually see some of the noise here that shows up. Where obviously I might have like a little too light of a phase showing up. And those are these overlaps that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be there. Now when you have bad image, then it's called good luck, which is this is the image from my PhD thesis. So normally what you would do in simple thresholding, you would just say, well, my phase zero, 
is all of the uh, intensities at X, Y, Z that are less than some threshold. My phase one is everybody above and I'm done. And you can do multiple thresholds as necessary. And this is appropriate for high quality images. If you have something like this, so I have rings from X-ray tomography, if you remember the ring artifacts, okay. I have quite a bit of noise. My eyes see clearly two phases. This is actually a polyethylene. It's pretty homogeneous, nice material to image. These days, this image wouldn't be, be this bad. Okay. It's actually trivial to image as well. But these were one of the earliest images, so it wasn't as trivial. So this is, but if I actually apply this method to this, even though my eyes see clearly two, two images, you're going to get surface that is really poor. And this is the histogram, and this is why. Look at the overlap of these two peaks. Yeah, there are peaks, but overlap is really bad. Now, if you went with your, so this is what's often done in segmentation. Well, I'm going to validate this with some type of measurement I have. So you have a measurement of helium porosity in the lab. Great. You have it bind you over a much larger core than the one you imaged. But let's say that that's something you want to anchor your thresholding or your segmentation with. And you kind of move this threshold a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left to adjust to that number. You can do that if it makes you feel better. <laughs> but really, as long as you're roughly in the, in the, on the order, like in, in that neighborhood, plus, minus 20, 30%, there is no telling that anchoring to porosity of this big of a core to something that is imaged of this size is going to be, like, be really it. Okay? Again, if you want to anchor to something, by all means, anchor it. But you're still going to get image that looks like this, no matter where you put this threshold. And you might evaluate porosity and get the number that you want. Great. Okay. And if you just, all you're doing is counting voxels, how many of them there are. Okay. Most of the images with noise like this, they will average well if you compute porosity. That number will look good. But you look at the image and you're like, what is this? And that is all also fine if all you, uh, you are after is porosity, even maybe if you want to compute permeability. You know what will suffer? Well, boundary condition. Well, knowing in every Stokes equation, it's going to set value zero close to these boundaries, so it's going to be very low velocity near those walls. Overall permeability measurement will not suffer much either. Kind of noise around the wall. It's stagnant flow there anyway. So for the major throughput through this rock, what matters is this middle here, okay? And what basically conducts through the middle. So you're not even going to have a very much trouble with permeability. But if measuring this surface area is something that you're interested in, you're completely off. And you actually have the super noise rather than the surface that you need. Or if you're looking at the surface reactions of some sort, you're going to do very poorly. So the point I'm making here is that things are relative to what you're trying to do. And sometimes even if the met method is roughly relatively bad and you have quite a bit of noise, you can still get something out of it. This average value of porosity will be there in the ballpark somewhere. You're not going to get a huge uh, off value. So you're going to be able to get by or match it quickly, but that doesn't ma mean that you have a good segmentation method. Okay. But depending what you actually have as an end goal, it might be uh, just fine. So it's something that you have to understand. So this finding the magic threshold typically doesn't work. Uh, there's a lot of work that has been done in picking a threshold that uniquely and precisely defines phases in an image, just giving, given the statistics. And unfortunately, it's sub subjective unless we know and we don't where the phases are. Um, different users will decide on different thresholds, and even methods will go completely off on once you actually look at the image and the result. So it's something that you still have to evaluate. 
There's something called OTSUS method, and we're gonna work on it, where basically you select the threshold to optimally separate two phases in a statistical sense. Okay. And again, that sometimes works well, sometimes doesn't. If you have a lot of noise, no matter what the thresholding is, it's still thresholding. Okay? So picking the magic one will not get you far. Second part uh, is you have to be careful with the images you have. Uh, in microtomography, you're correlating with density, so that's typically correlating well with phases, unless you're interested in uh, individual in minerals that might not have good separation under X-ray. But uh, a lot of times our eyes, especially in terms of photographs or, or microscopy images, our eyes are not confused at what they're seeing, or our brain, I should say, uh, eyes themselves don't see, um, but the, the the method trying to segment this based on the gray levels will be very much confused. So if I'm just looking at the gray levels, the reflection here I have through glass and the fluids will cause a lot of trouble. I have no trouble figuring out, oh, this is a solid wall, this is a solid wall, this is one fluid, so this is water and oil in a capillary beautiful image. I would actually say, well, that is a really clear image, isn't it? Well, let me try to segment those three five phases and work with thresholding technique. So I'm going to pick darker stuff and not so dark stuff. I'm going to get this red phase. What is this red phase? Is it glass? Is it oil? Is it water? A little bit of all, okay? depending on where the reflection is. So that's going to be a really poor choice. So you can't go necessarily automatic. And this can affect you in micro models as well. If I look at the histogram, I even if I look at the histogram, I kind of have some separation. I have two phases in there, it looks like. Okay. And wherever you move this threshold, you're going to have an image like this. So you can't physically do much with threshold like here. So you have to be careful. And this is a little bit. Actually, let's, do you want to try this out? So I sent you a link. Just to break up my talking, I sent your link to a folder. There is an image called photo capillary there. <clears throat> is folder reachable? Did anybody try? Okay. It's a YouTube box. So there's various places actually, there's Im image yeah. and you can adjust threshold. There's also somewhere in math, process math make, or no, process binary make binary where it's just gonna choose a threshold for you. I don't think it gives you yes. So it just does it. Um, in analyze, where, where did I say? Image adjust threshold. You can actually, uh, oh, oh. Yes, okay, so it says this is a, oh, this is a red, green, blue. Okay, we're gonna convert this image to grayscale. It's, it has, it's a color image actually. It's a proper photograph. Adjust to 8-bit first. <clears throat> There's no real color in this, it's just a format. That... So adjust to 8-bit, type 8-bit, and then image adjust threshold. 
Okay. And this is, you can kind of play with, the, with where this threshold is. So I can actually play with it to at least lose this identification of water. But because of the issues near these boundaries and reflection near the solid wall, if I actually was interested in physical modeling using this, even if I find, find a way to fill this in, look, I get a layer of oil supposedly along my glass tube. Ain't that realistic? <laughs> if we know anything about the wettability of glass, uh -uh. <laughs> and that's because of the reflection near boundary made it darker, okay? And image said, well, it must be oil if it's dark, right? So there is a lot of cleanup that we need to figure out what to do with this, okay? If you want to play with any others, so if you open, there's that tomographic oil slice, if you open it, Maybe enlarge it a little. Let's image adjust threshold there. Okay. So we can see two peaks, but we can see the noise. This is picking up too much pore space into my solid face. This is eroding my solid face too much. Okay. Is somewhere in there is and here this is actually there are, these are the different methods for picking a threshold so you can pick a method where it's going to try to statistically separate these fa fa phases and make them as far away from each other as possible and when you hit apply you get a black and white image which is what we call a segmented image and sometimes also binary image. So in this case, black, this is actually kind of inverted, but I think that can be adjusted right here. It's typical for black to be zero and white to be, so this is just the inverting LUT, here we go. Typically 255 means white and zero means black, but you can, uh, this was for some reason inverted. Did everybody get this? Can you what? This one threshold. It's image adjust threshold. And I think it took me five years to remember where it's at. I always go to analyze or to process or to something. <laughs> and then you have this menu with 100 choices. And then in threshold, you can actually put this automated. These are different methods for picking a threshold. And you can, in certain cases, find that one or the other works the best. But again, beware of thresholds. That's all I'm saying. Sometimes they work really well. And in those cases, you can pick them yourself and just place them there. And in all other cases, be careful. So now, how would I actually, for instance, quantify porosity from here? How will I get that number for, using the functions we've already used in this course? Uh, what? If you histogram this right now, would it be precisely? Different? You're gonna histogram. You're gonna get two peaks only. So let's do that. Analyze histogram. Okay. Here we go. Peak one, peak two, and here here's where the list is helpful. You're gonna see 5,600 and change of value zero and this much of value 255. Okay. So sum them up, that's the total number of pixels. It's actually 100 by 100, I believe. No, uh, it's 300 by 24, no. It's 100 by 100. Okay. And this is 255, correct? Then I move around. So if this was 255 and I have 
four, three, four, nine. So it's 43, 44 percent. Between 43 and 44 percent porosity. So the fraction, because it's 100 by 100, so it's easy to divide. Yes? Simple quantification. Different segmentation methods will label the phases differently. You kind of have to know what the labeling is. It could be just 0 and 1. Okay. So that's up to the software that is processing it. Okay. So with that exercise, let's get back. <clears throat> now, segmentation algorithms, since it's such a common thing and such a fundamental thing to do, regardless of whether you're working in porous media or not, right, it could be based on any images anywhere, it could be medical imaging, or whether some sort of scientific imaging, it could be just photographs, it could be anything. There's, in, it's impossible to lift the two just as all the segmentation Algorithms and different algorithms work, work differently uh, uh, depending on what is the type of imaging device, what is the type of noise we have, what it is that we are imaging. Now, the simplest method is global or simple thresholding. And then there are some statistical methods such as k means plus 3, as well as some thresholding and adapting locally. So I typically threshold some of the image where I'm super certain that I'm doing a good job using the threshold. And then there is a population in between that I kind of locally examine my image and try to make a decision. And such methods are called locally adaptive. Um, this is indicator creating in Marty Hayes work as some of those. And then there's so-called region growing and active contours based methods where I let kind of two regions grow and compete against each other and where they meet, that's where my boundary is. So that is kind of an appealing way to do it. There's a review paper that I see somewhere down the line in your future, in your homework. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, some of the classical papers. And it's actually, there's a, a cool, cool story that I can tell now since it's been a moment. Um, it's papers from 2009 and in its initial version, I got it for a review. And it had something like 21 methods. The authors implemented 21 methods, which is an amazing number of methods and compared them. But the way they style the paper is like they're looking for a magic threshold. And for a lot of methods, things were working like slice by slice as opposed to looking them as 3D objects or 3D images. So they were somewhat directionally dependent. And I shot back and what are you doing? <laughs> looking for a magic threshold, it's not going to work. There's no way to validate that. And also, do stuff with 3D. And I, was, I, I thought I, I felt a little bad, but I thought I shut down the paper, even though it kind of. But I did write up like three pages of constructive comments, and they came back and it said to all of them that it's one of the best review papers I've seen <laughs> on this topic. So it really goes to forest media and tries to compare things, what works well, what it doesn't. Um, so in, 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 in some sense, uh, it's, it's one of the, I don't think that there is such an exhaustive paper in general uh, for these type of media, and mostly for X-ray computed tomorrow. So again, it's, it's a very good paper, a very good review paper, and the number of methods they uh, reviewed is quite amazing. Um, Manual segmentation has been very common in medical imaging, but it's common and it's also common in analysis of SEM images where geologists go and pick at least some of the portion of the image manually and the rest maybe there's a semi-automatic help. It's something that is a big no for 3D images that typically we encounter for there are simply too many slices to process, and it's not something that scales up like that. So if you have just a smaller number of slices, if you have only 15 slices through a brain, you can go and afford yourself to uh, manually contour where the brain is. Okay. But that's something that is impossible, though it's not done manually anymore. Um, but it's not, um, 
possible to do for the porous medium. Even if there is some manual work, uh, so automated analysis will typically do a selection. So these days in medical in imaging, especially if you're trying to identify tumors in images, the automated processing will kind of figure out, well, what is the dose with high probability of having malignant tumor? And then they will hand it to a doctor and say, well, you make the final call. So in which case, the automation still helps. Now, some sort of user interference, such as picking a threshold, is typically required. So you cannot really, for a good quality result, don't expect just to click a button and it sub somehow magically works. Uh, there is also, so now I will go through a number of different methods before we actually go to a, a, a larger 3D image uh, as an exercise. So there's statistical region merging, and this is actually how it's going to, uh, what is it going to do in this photograph. Now, how many phases you should be seeing here, it's a very good question. Uh, depending on what you, you can actually set, sort of uh, tell it to please try to find this many phases, okay? And the statistical al algorithm will try to merge sort of neighboring locations into groups based on some criteria. So in this case, I don't know, I would say that this, all of this should be grass because I know it's grass. Image doesn't know it's grass and sees grass that is slightly different co color here. And then you have these two regions here, including some dark spots where whatever branches or soil something is peeking through. So just because your eyes see what is there, that doesn't mean that uh, that's what really is. Okay? So you would want to, for certain applications, just to merge all of these. And in that case, you have to go in manually and say, well, merge all of this stuff. That's all grass. Yeah, I don't care. So expect certain level of involvement in the final analysis of what it is that you want to see in the image. Now, you can actually test this statistical uh, region merging in, uh, in both imaging and MATLAB. Uh, but what typically people do is they kind of iteratively go down in number of phases, phases of how many to expect. If I know that I have two, I can try to achieve two immediately, or I can just kind of uh, locally kind of merge all of these pixels into one group, all of these pixels into one group. And what, uh, what the algorithm will try to do is separate them into groups that are kind of as distant as possible in terms of the values. So here's an example here, if your distance or critical distance is 0.3, then these values so in, this, in this sequence, these values will be merged together. And you're saying basically critical distance is 0.3, so you're saying that anything above 0.3 distance is far away. Okay? So the next group will be 3.2. I don't have anything close to it, so next group is 4.9, and then finally next group. And this is now, this one is kind of borderline, so it's actually a good question uh, whether this should be actually all together or, but, ah, so here, technically 4.9 and 5.1 are together, but if these two are, these over here, I interpret it as close together, then algorithm is trying to separate 4.9 as a separate phase. Okay, so those are little, and obviously sometimes you don't have a unique way to separate that. Well, will I interpret these are 0.2 apart, right? Will I interpret these two as a group and these two as a group, or these three as a group and this one separate from them? And that possibly in a three-dimensional image also depends on their physical location and how far they, are they nearby each other or are they separate? This is just a one-dimensional image. So this is something that you have to be, uh, so depending on the order in which numbers are processed or depending on where they are spatially, these decisions might be made and they're not necessarily unique. 
So you kind of always, as a user, have to go in and evaluate what has happened. Here's indicator krigging. This is one of the uh, sort of statistical methods. Here is another one uh, image that has quite a bit of noise. It's one of the early images. We have seen that already. It's a Berea sandstone sample slice. And what the, what the, what the method does is, okay, well, this is my histogram, okay? So obviously I have two peaks that are kind of merged uh, together. So what it does is say, okay, every, everybody below this threshold, I know that those are one phase. I trust those. And I trust that this is another phase. It's all of this stuff in between that I'm not so certain. <laughs> so then I allocate these so you can see them as white and black in this image. And then yellow and red are the ones that I'm not so certain about. And then the algorithm goes and analyzes each neighborhood and statistically decides what is the probability of the pixel in question or voxel in question to be zero phase or one phase depending on its neighborhood and what are the other. And it's using correlations for that, image correlations for that. So essentially, then at the end of the algorithm, yellow ones were decided to be zero or poor phase. So they were grouped together with white into the final white phase. And the red ones and black ones were grouped together in the final black phase. And we see that a lot of noise that I would initially, by thresholding, I would get this like very noisy images and lots of white in white speckles in the middle of my sandstone phase, okay? Those things have been removed and smoothed out. So it's a pretty smooth result for the, this noisy of an input. Okay? And this is where thresholding in itself would also miserably fail. Okay? So in that sense, uh, this is one of the methods. And this is one of the methods that actually comes from uh, my former PhD advisors group. And it means one of the best images for this type of, uh, best, best methods for these type of images. It is quite a bit involved. So if you have a large image, in order to solve for these, it's actually processing a very, for all of the unknown pixels and voxels, you're solving one large um, system of equations. And that's done iteratively, so it can actually take quite a moment to solve. Okay. Now, <laughs> how do I evaluate whether I did a good job? This her visually, well, it looks good, okay? Now we can now zoom in into this region here. Say, well, what did the algorithm decide to do? This is what I'm my, ultimately my phase is. Do I trust it? Do you see this shape here, the solid shape? Could be one way or the other, okay? There's no way to tell directly, really. So I can say, well, given the uncertainties, it did a pretty good job. <laughs> now, if I was trying to evaluate strictly, what we would do is we would come up with a test. So you actually take a known image and throw in noise. That's one way. And then see how this algorithm does with noise. So in this particular case, you actually have here, like, this would be the result. So this is my test with the noise, and I know what the original was. You can kind of see the traces of the original image. And simple thresholding fails because of the noise. There was another original algorithm called Maria Hainsworth, which kind of does better job than thresholding, but it's also not great. And then this is indicator Krieging, so it improved much better. Well, this is great if all of the noise was this salt and pepper noise that you could add uh, to your image, but that's fake type of noise. Okay? We know that in X-ray tomography, the kind of the ultimate result that we get, it has sort of non-linear effects in noise in there, so still might need to be a little more careful. So that's one way to test, modeling way. Other than that, my only insight into that three-dimensional image is the image I'm looking at, so it's often hard to tell. I can try to match porosity the way I told you at the very beginning. Okay? Again, if it makes you feel better, <laughs> do it. But it's not, again, 
point by point it's not going to tell you whether you got a good uh, whether you have a correct result on a point by point basis okay. now <laughs> my colleague Dorothy Wiltenschild once upon a time got really upset about the segmentation and how um, how uh, it can give different results and that, that that's not the way science should work so she went and purchased really expensive, smooth beads, glass beads. You say, okay, I know what I'm imaging. Now, if you've ever purchased glass beads, let's say that you're looking for one millimeter diameter beads, you're going to get, uh, package will say something, well, 90% of these beads are in this, in this range, which is narrow around one millimeter, but not one millimeter precisely. Okay? And the more money you're willing to pay, more precise they get. Okay, <laughs> so she went and paid a lot of money for uh, very well defined and also capillary tubes. That's an easy one. Okay, we can measure the capillary tube. So she imaged them at different. So this is a capillary tube with also the this was kind of also multi phase flow. Kind of, I have two value uh, two fluid phases in there. So basically, she did different diameters and this very precision, precise bead pack, okay? And you can actually find it in this 2010 paper, okay? So this is the bead pack. And then she knew precisely what she packed inside, so she could uh, basically tell how well these uh, images do. So that's one way to validate. However, the only way to validate is in this idealized perfect system. I know that my real rock is my real rock. And there's no telling how much impurities or feldspar is going to be in there. Okay? And that's something that is always going to throw off algorithms slightly. So it's good to validate, but then understand that on a certain level, you can only do so well. Okay? That still shouldn't prevent you to get some uh, good conclusions. Now, in terms of software, 2D segmentation exists on your phone if you want it. Okay, so it's going to process your uh, photographs, images, you name it very quickly and manipulate them. But that's not necessarily, those methods are typically based on thresholding in some form and they're not necessarily appropriate for volumetric images. For 3D, you need efficient algorithms and we're going to name uh, some more of them later. Um, ITK uh, is it's, it's a free software library. It's a single most extensive segmentation library but it's mostly for medical applications and those images tend to be smaller than in porous media. So it's, it, it might simply not be adapted very well. Uh, let me just two minutes to finish this slide. So basically 3D visualization software will do some thresholding simply to visualize surfaces in between uh, 3D objects. Okay? And that's essential way to visualize in 3D because otherwise things will occlude each other and I cannot just easily visualize. So it's kind of good for any type of visualization, but not necessarily quantification after it. And then there are 3D image analysis uh, libraries. The nature of these is that they have been mostly outdated. Uh, this one is still active. This one you, you can get if you know me. Um, these two have not, uh, or these two have not been publicly available for a long while, only if you have research connections to Australian uh, National University. And I'm not certain this one is, I, I found it at some point. I'm not sure that it's active anymore. Um, that said, ImageJ has actually, ImageJ has emerged and we are exemplifying it throughout this slide as one of the libraries that it has uh, quite a decent collection of image analysis software available. So with that, uh, we're going to uh, continue commenting on software and some more examples on uh, Friday. And I will post homework by the end of the day. <laughs>